Hello there, fight friends. MMA Andy Cotterell here with Christian the Ghost Tremaine, all the way from Langley, British Columbia. We are here to speak about his upcoming fight against Christian Savoie at FLA 13, which is not only the main event, but it will be for the first ever professional title in FLA history, and they are fighting for the welterweight title. Christian, hi, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Andy. It's my pleasure. Before we get started, actually, as we get started, would you mind just taking a minute, two minutes, and just telling everybody watching who you are and, and where you're from and what you do and how you got into fighting? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, my name's Christian Tremaine. Uh, grew up in Langley, BC, just outside of Vancouver here, um, just on the outskirts. And, uh, yeah, so I got into, uh, got into mixed martial arts um, when I was about 15 years old and, uh, just, uh, yeah, really fell in love with jujitsu. And so as I kind of started competing jujitsu and everything like that, I was like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try, try out the MMA thing. So I think I was 17 when I had my first fight, um, 29 now. So there's, there's been a lot of, a lot of ups and downs throughout that journey, uh, mm -hmm. 12 years, but, um, we're here now and uh, kind of taken a new approach with things recently and uh, made some life changes and stuff. And so things have been really swinging on, swinging up for me. So we're, we're looking forward to this next fight. And uh, yeah, it's definitely against a formidable opponent, Christian Savoie. Um, so yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be a banger for sure. Um, I, I think the, the fight fans should, um, should definitely get their money's worth on this one. Whenever somebody wants to succeed at the highest levels of something, they have to sort of have that conversation with themselves about what kind of commitment they want to put in. So, you know, you're getting to a spot now, your main event of, of, a, of a fight card, and you just talked a moment ago about making life changes. Is there anything you can talk about that you that you made any things you didn't to change your life to give yourself a better chance of being successful? Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, there's a few things I can speak on there. Um, yeah. So, uh I've always been told that like, you know, if you, if you have a goal, there's, there's point A and point B where you are and where you want to get to. Um, and the fastest way from point A to point B is a straight line. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's things outside of the gym, you know, you're in the gym. If you're, if you're a professional, you know, you're probably in the gym three to four hours a day and then, you know, um, and there's 24 hours in the day. Right. And then, you know, if you're getting a healthy amount of sleep, you're getting your eight hours. Um, so there's only so many hours in the day that, but only so much time that you can train that, that leaves us with these, you know, eight to 10 hours of mm -hmm. downtime. Right. And so it, it depends what you're doing in those downtime hours. Right. Um, are you doing the mental work as well? And, um, so, so there's things like, you know, I used to think journaling was, you know, like I just didn't, wasn't into it. Um, but now, you know, like, uh, writing down, you know, your, your aspirations, just something about putting, putting something down on paper definitely, definitely helps me. Um, also just like, uh, habits, right. Um, you know, there was a, there was a time, um, where I would kind of always be, I'd be grinding and work, working my ass off. And then I would tell myself like, Hey, you know, you're, you're allowed to cut loose at the end of the day, you know, you put in a good day's work and stuff. Um, but the guys at the top level, they're not, they're not giving themselves grace, you know, they're, they're hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of where I'm finding myself nowadays where you realize that like, you know, when you're younger and stuff, um, you kind of have some coaches and stuff and it's nice if you can get a good coach and stuff. And, but at the end of the day, everybody's got their own, their own lives, their own careers. If, if anybody's skilled in this sport, a lot of the coaches are ex fighters. Right. Um, so, you know, sometimes they have their own careers going and stuff like that. Right. So it's really about self accountability. And that's, that's something that I'm just, as I get older, I'm learning more and more that, you know, I need to be my hardest, hardest critic. I need to be the guy that's always on my ass um, making sure, you know, I've never had a problem with making it into the gym and practice. Um, but yeah, there's just been some stuff outside of the, outside of the gym and outside of the mm -hmm. cage that I've cleaned up that, um, you know, took some work, but, uh, I, I definitely feel like came out the other side stronger with it. And that's about as far as I'd like to go into that. Yeah, no problem. Well, there's a direct, uh, correlation between what you just said and, and, you know, you as a fighter and the rest of the world, non-fighters, because, all of us have our lives that we have 
trials and tribulations we go through. And most of us have to sort of have that conversation with ourselves and, and decide whether or not we're going to cut something out of our life, whether it's a, a relationship or, or a, a work opportunity or it's a family member or whatever. We all have to do that, right? Like we decide what's, what's no longer good for us. And it's tough because sometimes, you know, it feels for me personally, it feels bad sometimes putting myself in front of others, but y- y- you have to take care of yourself. You have to be, you know, putting yourself number one sometimes. And it's, I don't think it's selfish at all. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I, I don't think it's selfish either, especially when you look in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I got a good friend, Cole Smith. Um, like he always says, you, you gotta be selfish, you know, when you're in the room, uh, if you're looking for a sparring partner and you know, like you're looking for the guy that's going to give you the most trouble, um, you know, somebody who's not quite your size, you know, like you gotta be selfish, you know, so you're, you're finding those guys that are going to push you every single round. Um, you know, uh, no charity rounds, I guess you could say, right? Like, um, you, you want to make sure that you're getting those hard rounds. And, uh, yeah, like you say, like, it's it's not selfish, but in the sense, you got to think about it in that in that way, for sure. I think it's important for us to have a balance where there's times where we're selfish and there's times where we allow ourselves to defer to the other person, somebody we care about, or a training partner. Like, you can't always be the one getting what you want in the training room. Sometimes you have to be there for your partners, right? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you're doing the move. Sometimes you're the UK. Yep, exactly. Yeah. What do you do for uh, for a job? You said something in the trades. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a, an iron worker. Uh, sometimes mm. people know it as steel work, um, but uh, structural iron. So uh, you know, like high rises, bridges. Uh, a lot of in- I've worked most of my career in the industrial sector. Um, you know, material transport and stuff like that. Um, but the nice thing is, is I work for a union, um, so they they dispatch me when I want, and I come and go as I please, and so, um, or when there's work, you know. But uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I've got a pretty good reputation in in the union hall here uh, as a hard worker, and so I, I can I can go money up for a little bit, and then you know take some time off, and uh, that's exactly what I've done here. When I fought, when I signed to fight Cam Nelson at the last FLA twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought to myself, Hey, here's a, here's a guy who's going to give me some trouble here. So, you know, like if I'm not at my a game, cause when I'm working generally with iron working shifts, you know, I'm working 12 to or 10 to 12 hours. Uh, so to make training every day, seven days a week, a lot of the time is, you know, that's a, a victory in itself. Right. But that's seven sessions a week. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when I'm not working, I can do 14 to 16 sessions. Right. So that allows me to lift weights. I can go to wrestling, I can go to striking. So instead of two striking classes, you know, four jujitsu classes and one sparring session a week, you know, um, my third fight back, I fought this guy, Colton Boxell. And yeah, I, the entire, the entire time, um, I was working 10, 12, we even hit a couple like 15 hour shifts. Uh, you know, if there's barges that got to be offloaded, you know, there's time sensitive stuff and, uh, you know, working a, working a 14 hour shift, you know, you really, there's a lot of justification in missing training, you know? Sure. Um, um, so, you know, and then, but it's, it's a factor of life, you know, I got to pay the rent. Um, I'm just, you know, learning to accept a little bit more help these days. And, um, you know, so through sponsorship and then, uh, you know, like I, I feel bad, you know, I, I know, I don't know why, but, um, I feel bad charging people 60, 80 bucks for private lessons, right. For an hour of my time. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's nice sometimes, you know, these guys, they just, um, they also want to help me out. Right. So, um, it's nice to have, you know, I I almost look at teaching privates as like a form of sponsorship, right. Because those guys are the ones that are keeping food in my fridge and a roof over my head. Yep. Yep. You know, so that really helps me, uh, to keep the dream alive and keep, keep, like I say, the 14 to 16 sessions a week instead of the six or seven, right? I'm not very educated about iron working. In fact, I'm, my, my knowledge about it's almost zero, but I'm, is it, would it be safe to say that it's a physically demanding job? Oh, very. Yeah. And there's, there's different, uh, different tasks within the trade, but I'm what you call a connector. And so the connector's job is we're at the tip of the crane, basically, wherever the load on the crane is going, that's where we're we're going to install that piece of steel. And so that, that requires, you know, I'm carrying a belt with wrenches and a hammer and, uh, it's what's called a sleever bar. It's just a 36 inch, uh, long metal bar. 
but um you're probably maneuvering the load too like you've got ropes and lines and you're hauling it and pulling it into place and stuff 100 percent, yeah and then once that piece gets in there what we do is we got these pointy tools and there's two holes there and we just got to try and line them up so yeah I'm, you know i'm basically doing l low lap holes a lot of yeah. the day uh, and then there's a lot of like, you know, where I'm walking the beam and then I got to sit down on the beam and then stand back up and then uh, climbing columns as well. That's a that's a big part of it, which is really fun, actually, in, in, in my opinion. Um, climbing yeah, a column. Is that like yeah. climbing a tree? Like you have one of those waist straps that you go up the columns or how does that work? No, sir. Um, so it's uh, the beams like I don't know if you know what an I-beam looks like. It's not mm -hmm. actually an I-beam. It's called a wide flange beam. I beams are a little bit different, but, uh, so yeah, what you do is you lock your feet in between. So the two horizontal parts of the eye, and then you've got your web. So you lock your feet in there and then you're just pulling yourself up on the, on the one front front flange. Right. Sounds so it's, dangerous. Uh, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, um, you know, we, we, we wear harnesses and we tie off and everything like that. Um, but yeah, you know, I've known a, a fair bit of guys who have fallen and, um, you know, like my dad was, I'm a second generation iron worker. My dad was also an iron worker. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, he's definitely known some people that have, that have fallen to their deaths as well. And so Ooh. it's, it's definitely a, a, a scary job, but that's why I do it. This is like, I, I'm a fighter because I like the adrenaline, you know, and I've had some, probably some bigger adrenaline rushes iron working than I have ever fighting. Right. You know, like, I bet. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially like it's, it's kind of like a, bit of a boys club but uh so you know you see your buddy do something and you go like okay well he, if he can do it i can do it you know you know and then sometimes if that's walking like a three inch angle while you're 100 feet in the air you know it's <laughs> you're like well i'm gonna i'm gonna be called a pussy if i don't do this you know so um yeah, yeah. It, it can be scary but you know you, you just you know the, and that's like a lot there's a lot of similarities i find with iron working and fighting where you know you, you you look at this and you go okay i don't know if i can do this i don't know if i can do this but if I don't do this to the best of my ability right now, the likelihood of getting hurt is far higher. Sure. Uh, of course. Yeah. So, you know, you, you really just got to go, okay, by the, by the grace of God, go I, you know, and uh, really just kind of um, put your best foot forward. But yeah, definitely physically demanding. The reason why I asked the question and I've got a follow-up question, do you know who Dorian Yates is? Have you ever heard of him? Yes, sir. The bodybuilder. Yep. Yeah. He's like a seven time Mr. Olympia. I yep. saw an interview with him once and he mentioned how when he's asked for advice by young bodybuilders on how to drastically improve their physique, what they should do. He said his first bit of advice, he said, if you want to be a bodybuilder professionally and you want this to be your career, then whatever your job is now, quit that job and go get a job that involves heavy lifting, whether you're <laughs> digging ditches, whether you're carrying rocks or whether you're carrying steel, whatever it is that kind of work that you put in day in day out for years at your job will increase your body's capacity for weight and muscle. So I, uh, you know, I'm just betting that this is probably really beneficial to you as a, as a fighter. Yeah. Well, you know, you see, you see a lot of these fighters doing workouts with the weighted vest on and stuff like that. But like I say, I'm, I'm climbing columns. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of, a lot of the old timers, they poke fun at me cause I carry too many tools, but my belt is probably when it's loaded with bolts, it's probably about 50 pounds. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, and I'm wearing that. It's it's not just a, a waist belt. It's a waist belt tied into a shoulder harness. Harness. As well. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Just an overall harness. So I'm I'm sharing the weight between my hips and my shoulders. Um, but at the same time, like like I say, you know, you're, you're um, there's studies that show like obese people that get skinny, they they retain that bone density, right? So sure. In my head, what I'm telling myself is, hey, I'm just building <laughs> just building bone density. You know. Uh, there you I'm go. My body here. Yeah. Nice. Uh, you train at Revolution, don't you? Um, I have, I, I'm a little bit out of revolution still. Um, okay. I, um, so just, I was teaching there as well. And, uh, I just wanted to, I found myself like every weekend I was going to tournaments to coach the kids and, you know, I just wanted to give myself a little bit more focus on myself. And then also mm -hmm. I ran into some financial issues and had to go back to ironworking. So I went back to, uh, ironworking and worked on the Patella bridge here, connecting Surrey to New Westminster and uh did that for four or five months and then now i'm just doing my own thing but so yeah i train at revolution um but then my main training spot is on guard jiu jitsu in pit meadows uh, and then i've got a striking coach in pit meadows at pit meadows combat club as well um so yeah so i i've still got a lot of relationships and friends and everybody at revolution so i go there you know multiple times a week to train and you know see everybody 
Nice. Uh, but, but yeah, Matt Kwan is my uh, my main grappling coach now, and he's the instructor at On Guard Jiu Jitsu. And then Connor Gallagher is my striking coach. Um, and yeah, Connor Connor's been in my corner for the last two, um, and he will be again for FLA thirteen. Uh, Matt Kwan can't make the make the trip out with us, but I'll have Joel mm-hmm. Joel Jacquard um, from uh, Halifax BJJ Society yep. second as my second corner seat and he's definitely a wealth of knowledge so that'll be that'll be great yeah i've known joel for many many years how did you get involved with him did you meet him at your last trip to fla yeah so fla fla by the way they're an awesome promotion to work for if yep. you're a young fighter watching this you know definitely uh go on their website and they just have a registration form just that's how i got involved with them is just uh re- get yourself registered on their website um so anyway so in my contract it you know it references a return flight so i just asked him i said hey you know like I, I see it's a return flight like does it have to be you know on the day after the fight you know can you give me a 10 days or so on the east coast so i'll travel around a bit and uh and so we did so i went up to uh sydney uh up cape breton there in nova scotia and trained with kent peters at zombie proof uh, mm-hmm. for a couple of days um grew in a relationship with him through instagram and uh, just wanted to you know meet him in person finally uh, and then after we did that, then we drove down to Halifax and uh, we trained at Halifax BJJ Society. And man, I can't, yeah, I can't say enough good things about Joel. You know, we, we were there for yeah. two to three days and, um, you know, he let us train for free. He came in, opened the gym up uh, so that we could wow. drill um, and just was the, the most accommodating host that you could ever ask for. And uh, then on top of that, we were, you know, we're, we're over there for just a little while. So we weren't going to bring geese or anything like that. We had, an, we had stuff to train no gi in, but not, not our geese. Mm-hmm. And uh, Joel comes out and, you know, I figured maybe you'd like have a couple of loner geese or whatever, if we were going to do gi class and he comes out and he pulls them out of the sleeve, they're brand new geese. And I was like, Oh man, I don't want to sweat up in brand new gi or whatever. And he goes, no, 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 it's fine. Like, you know, it, it, don't worry about it. Uh, and so I figure, okay, maybe he'll give him a wash and, you know, chuck him back in the bag or whatever. Um, but then at the end of class, he goes like, oh, take him home as a, as a souvenir. So basically, myself and my lady, uh, Maggie, um, gives us two two brand new geese just out of the goodness of his heart. You know, I, I'm trying to give him money and he, he just won't take it. And then, you know, he's like, and the best thing was, is he goes like, this is the beauty of jiu-jitsu and the, the family that jiu-jitsu creates. Yep. And I thought that was really cool. You know, the way he runs his gym, um, his attitude on life, you know, it's just one of those people that you can tell um you just just got a really good heart and you know a good person to know yeah i was in i lived in halifax for over 20 years and i think about going back off and it was a wonderful place for sure yeah it's very accommodating yeah and then derek derek uh called ahead and let him know that we were coming in so yeah it was it was great to have that connection and you know just good guy to know Moving on to Fight League Atlantic, you're fighting at FLA 13 in just a, a week or so, and you're fighting Christian Savoie. I know you did your FLA promo with that little video interview and stuff, and I, I watched it. Just what do you think about Christian as an opponent, and when you were offered his name, you know, what was your thought process before you accepted the fight? Um, so Savoie is obviously, you know, top of the top of the welterweight rankings for in Canada here um, pretty well. And uh, so I've always, you know, always admired the the fight style and then um but one thing i will say is just about his record right if you look at uh, most of his fights um previous to his triangle choke loss um there wasn't many uh many guys that he had fought with winning records um and i understand my record isn't that good either um you know like i say i, I kind of fell off the rails a little bit um but uh yeah as an opponent, definitely, definitely he's no slouch. You know, I'm going to have to bring my A game for sure. Uh, but I think he is his, for a nine and one and one record, I think he's uh, not quite as good as his record would reflect. And mm-hmm. I think there's a reason that he's not in the UFC after being nine and one, right? Because the UFC, they also look at things like that, like, okay, well, you know, it's not just about the record. It's about who you fought as well. And th- that's the other thing too, is that I'm, I'm not trying to just make the UFC, you know, I, I fight because I love it. Um, when I make the UFC, I will stay in the UFC. I'll be there, you know, cause that's, that's the level I'll be at. You know, I, I'm not trying to take smart fights just to make my, just to get myself there. Um, you know, I've, I've fought 
everybody that's ever been offered to me essentially so mm -hmm. um and i actually asked for this fight so i did a podcast before my fight with cam nelson and i said you know there's an interesting co-main event in robert pixley and um christian savoie i was like maybe the winner of that we could fight for the the 170 welterweight belt and so i think i put the bug in derek's ear there and um so anyway so savoie impressively won took out pixley there in the first round using those calf kicks and um so after the after i beat cam um my cornerman I, I see him running outside of the cage and he's trying to get in my line of sight here and he's mouthing to me mention savoie mention savoie <laughs> and uh yeah so you know like a guy like savoie um he's he's been in the game a long time i've been in the game a long time we're both professionals um you know, I like to get a little spicy and shit talk and stuff like that. He didn't seem to be into it during that uh, FLA exposure interview. I'll talk a little shit, but, uh, but yeah, you know, definitely got to respect the skill and the toughness that's there. Um, but he, he does break, you know, and you see that in that, uh, I think it's Dorian Dekaj, uh fight. Well, that's the one draw that he has, which is an actual loss, you know, like that, that ref, I don't know who paid him, but um uh, but somebody, somebody made some money on that one, you know, like, uh, I think it was like five seconds left. They deducted another point, um, in that fight. And so, yeah, so it was basically Savoie just being out grappled. And that's, that's basically how I see this fight going. I do want to finish him. I want to show people that I can, uh, that I am a finisher, not, not just out here winning decisions, mm -hmm. but if I do win a decision, mark my words, it'll be exciting. You know, you have your opinions about him as a fighter and what his capabilities are, but regardless of that, independent of that, he does have a really good name with a good record. So what would a win over him mean to you in your career? Uh, well, you know, it's definitely something I'll be able to look back on with pride for the rest of my life on, uh, you know, um, moving forward when I win, um, that would put me at six and four, um, which I don't think is quite the uh the record that the ufc is looking for regardless of a four fight win streak or not um so derek and i have been talking and um so i think we'll probably look to uh sign another fight with fla after this um, and just for people listening who may not know that's derek clark who is the owner of fla along with john foster yes. yeah yeah derek <laughs> clark exactly yeah um and so, yeah, so if, uh, if I sign again with FLA, we were talking about possibly hopping back out there in April uh, for their FLA 14. I'm just looking to stay as active as possible. And um, yeah, there's uh, they're running an FLA grappling card the day before the mm -hmm. fight. And uh, my girlfriend, you said your girlfriend level. might get on that. Yeah. Yeah. She's very high level as well. She's uh, she's looking to get on that as well. So we'll have uh, we'll have a good time there and then. See have you ever looked into, uh, sorry, Christian, have you ever looked into any possible iron working jobs in, in Nova Scotia? Uh, when I was there, I was definitely going to pop by the, the hall there and stuff, but we actually have a fair bit of work in our hall right now. So it's hard to get a transfer when you're, when you have work in your hall, mm -hmm. unless you're moving there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of guys that come out out West looking for work. Right. So I don't know what the work scope is, is like, Got it. Uh, those two, those two bridges though, in Halifax, I mean, that, that definitely like, uh, my girlfriend makes fun of me because I just I'm obsessed with bridges and <laughs> mega construction. Yeah. Um, it's funny because as a former uh, Halifax resident, the the bridges people are fixated on them. You know all the construct all the work being done on them and getting painted on them. And when you sail on ships or boats under the under the thing, you always get like debris on you from from the construction or whatever. So anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, Christian, uh, that's all. I, I don't have any more questions. Did I, did I forget to ask you anything? Is there anything you'd like to mention or something that you think I forgot to ask? Um, nope. No, I think that's it. I think that's good. Yeah. I'll just, okay, uh, well, I'll just shout out to my, uh, my sponsors and a couple of the gyms. Uh, so yeah, I got on guard BJJ in pit Meadows, uh, revolution martial arts in Langley, uh, pit Meadows combat club in pit Meadows, universal MMA in Vancouver and Kazushi Grappling in Vancouver as well. Uh, then I've got Ghost Grappling is a clothing company. You can find them at ghostgrappling.com. They've mm. got really nice uh, rash guard and shorts. Now, was that your company? Like, uh, it's actually not my company, no. I, okay. I know that Ghost Grappling does make it confusing, but yeah, they're uh, they're one of my main sponsors. And Mike, the owner of Ghost Grappling, is a super nice guy. And he, he 
big shout out to Mike. Uh, he supports a lot of like uh, a lot of the local grapplers and stuff like that. And you know, he sponsors. I mean, probably half the fucking Lower Mainland, to be honest. Um, so yeah, he's definitely definitely a huge uh, philanthropist of the sport, I guess you could say. And then uh, Popeyes Langley is my supplements. They're keeping me fueled up for mm-hmm. this fight. And uh, yeah, Popeyes Langley, mention my name when you're in there. And that's all I got. Awesome. Well, Christian, uh, I'll be watching FLA on my computer screen when you're in the cage. So I wish you the best of luck. And fight friends, there you have it. We just finished with Christian the Ghost Tremaine fighting in the main event of FLA 13 for the FLA inaugural professional welterweight title. Good luck, Christian. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on.